in a world where zombies, ghosts, serial killers, and vampires all exist. It's Nico, Brian, Mike, and Dustin, and they are all that stand between you and the films that could end the world. Welcome to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Podcast. Just want to thank all our fans and listeners. We really appreciate y'all. Y'all mean the world to us. Uh, this has been a great year. Uh, before you get into tonight's film review, I just want to give a quick shout out to our website, don't go out there.com. Brian has done a fantastic job with the website. Can't compliment him enough for that. Uh, all of our episodes and interviews are there. If you want to listen there, maybe you, you know, you're in a work in an office environment. Uh, it's a little more convenient. You want to listen on our website. We have all of them from our very first episode of Nightmare on Elm Street. To our weekly release, uh, check out our website if you listen there. And we also have our, all of our interviews there. We've done some incredible interviews in the past. The, you know, th- this past month was Women in Horror. We've done some incredible uh, interviews with women like Heather Langenkamp, Lynn Shea. And we've also had some of your favorite slashers, Robert England. We had the one of the co-writers of the new Scream movies. Check out our interviews tab on our website. It's a lot more it's a lot more convenient to find our webs, our interviews on our website compared to like Apple or Spotify. We have our store. We have new t-shirts, hoodies. If you're in, if it's still cold where you are, uh, it's cold for like 30 minutes here in Florida. Then it's really hot again. Uh, we have like mouse pads or we have Shan's Poland, Etsy page. South Carolina. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, it was cold this morning, but then it got really hot in the afternoon again. Never fails. We have Shan's Etsy page attached. You want to grab a tumbler. And we also have all our social media links there. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. Like us, subscribe us, follow us, all that good stuff. We love interacting with our fans. We love meeting new people. We love answering your questions, reading your comments on the on the air. And we've got some really good comments. I'm looking forward to reading from uh, Instagram tonight. A lot of heartfelt comments about, you know, growing up with these kind of movies. So I'm excited to read that. And the last thing I want to shout out on our website is our Patreon. We call it Blood Donors. We have the traditional monthly reoccurring kind. This money does not go into our pockets. None of us, none of us hosts get the money. It just goes right back into the show. You know, it's not free to host our files for the MP3s. We have to make YouTube videos. We have to host our website. All that costs money. We do giveaways. That helps pay for that, and we really appreciate it. And we also have one-time donations. You're a big fan of a movie. Last week, we did uh, a legendary Blood Donor review Uh we have that option available. You want us to review a movie? Just check out our website. All right, let's jump into our film review tonight. We're kicking off a new month. Uh, Brother Dustin, this is your pick. Do you want to announce your pick uh, uh, for your theme and why you chose it? Oh, yeah, I thought you meant this movie was my pick. I was like, I don't think so. No, um, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I went with the parameters I threw out there to you guys were pre-1960s horror movies. I wanted us to get into some of these real certified classics. Certified hood classics. And, um, yeah. And <laughs> that Wakanda that, in the hood didn't qualify. I'm pretty upset about it, to be honest. No, and Nico's very excited, though, because all these movies are in black and white. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be a fun month. <laughs> Tonight is Brother Brian's pick. Uh, do you want to announce your pick and why you picked it? Yeah, man. Uh, so, obviously, 1931's Frankenstein. You click the button so you know what it is. But, look, this movie's nearly 100 years old. So how could I possibly have nostalgia for it? Well, that goes back to Universal Studios Florida. My most vivid core memories as a child go back you know, to going to Universal as a child with my family. So all these old Universal monster movies were at the forefront there. I mean, it still very much are, very much celebrated there. Um, I remember eating at the Monster Cafe, and inside they played these movies in a loop. So that was really the first time that, that I saw these movies and really – where my mind goes every time that we talk about them or I see them. Now, Nico said it last week, but without these groundbreaking things, we we don't have modern day horror like we do. Uh, but not just that. I mean, I like watching these old black and white movies like this. I mean, it's almost like since they didn't have modern day effects, they had to focus on story. And it's why the old black and white time machine movie is, is such a favorite of mine as well. Uh, obviously, they're based on the books, and we'll get into that, but there's just something I, I, I can't explain about these movies that just kind of captures me like nothing else does, and I couldn't think of a better way to kick off classics months than Frankenstein. All right, I'll go next real quick. 
I have no nostalgia for these movies because I'm only 32 years old, but I have heard of all of these iconic characters, uh, have, you know, a little bit of, you know, I have a little knowledge of them, but I haven't seen any of the movies. I'm going to be respectful, but I'm not going to lie to the people listening that I like these movies or enjoy them, but I respect them. And like Brian mentioned, you know, we don't have the horror we have now without these characters. So I'm going to be respectful, but I'm also going to be honest. Uh, I'll, I'll enjoy watching these movies once and, and never again, just just to be honest. Uh, so that's just my thoughts. Uh, Mike, you want to go next? Yeah, sure, man. So, you know, I, I, I was a little weary going into this month, not going to lie. But, you know, as I started to think about it, I'm like, all right, what a really good chance to just kind of dive into the history of horror in general. Uh, so I thought that was fun. Um, as far as Frankenstein goes, look, I haven't seen this movie since I was probably 14, 15 years old. And I saw it for the first time then. So this was only my second viewing. And I got to say, man, I, I think it holds up well. It is a really good representation of a bygone era of filmmaking. And I think it's fun to go back and revisit it every now and then. Kind of those like pauses in the actions with blank black screens. You get a lot of those cuts. Where it's almost like you're viewing a like a fancier play. You know, like a play on a movie screen, it kind of has that feel to it. Um, I really like some of these settings. I know that most of this is filmed, in, you know, on studio back lots and all that stuff. But I thought they did a really good job of capturing stuff, even in black and white. I, I think the effects for when they're used, they're not used very much. But I think they hold up well. And I got to say, Brian hit the nail on the head. The story is so strong. And look, I've read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein before in school a long time ago. Uh, I like the book, and I think while there's some differences, obviously, I think they do a good job here. You know, and 1931 literally is a different era of movies. So am I going to put this on all the time? No. Am I less hesitant to revisit this than I would have been before? Yes. I think uh, that's why I'm glad we do this show, guys, because it, it allows me to kind of open my mind and get out of my box and and i really enjoyed the performances i think there's some good acting here i think there's some really brilliant filmmaking while some of it may not hold up i think in general this movie holds up really well and i'm excited to talk about it and i'm glad dustin picked this theme month yeah i'm glad i picked it too and um you know i'd seen this movie years ago as well um but it was years ago and it's not something now really meant to watch when I watched it. So it didn't stick with me. So it was almost like a first time viewing when I watched this. Um, I like the runtime a lot. It felt like just, you know, watching an a, uh, ex- extended episode of a television show. Um, I think the effects do look good in some parts, but man, there's one scene in particular that I've got in my notes that uh, I'm going to shit on. Um, the story, <laughs> the story is a classic one and the character of Frankenstein I mean, it was so instrumental in getting us to where we are with the genre. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this movie wasn't even originally shot to be a horror movie because the, the term horror didn't come out in the genres until uh, 1934 is when they started using that. And so this was just a, a neat little monster story. But, um, yeah, it, it's a classic for sure. And I agree. It's not something I'm going to put on all the time, but it's definitely not something I would avoid because it's such an easy, quick watch. There you go. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, Any more opening thoughts? We just jump into the scene by scene. Yeah. I find it interesting that over the years that the monster has become the name Frankenstein instead Mm -hmm. of Dr. Frankenstein. And I know that's kind of a thing that everyone knows is common knowledge, but it makes it more interesting to me to go back and watch the film and just know that, no, this is Frankenstein, the doctor character and this is his monster, and we don't ever call it that. We just call it Frankenstein. I find that interesting how that just over time has kind of evolved into something that it's not. Well, I was just going to say in The Bride of Frankenstein, sure. they basically and, and just Son say, of Frankenstein. Hey, yeah, yeah, true. They, they start calling him Frankenstein in, in memoriam of his creator. Makes there sense. You. Makes sense. All right, guys, let's jump into it. The film starts with a man on stage giving us a friendly warning on the picture we're about to see. He speaks on Frankenstein and the mysteries of life and death. He says, if you can't handle the stress, leave now. We've warned you. Title card and opening credits roll. We're at a funeral now as a bell rings and people cry and pray. Henry and Fritz arrive and look at the funeral from a distance. The people walk away from the grave and a man begins to fill in the site with dirt. He lights his pipe and walks away. 
Henry and Fritz dig up the grave now and remove the casket. They take it down a path until they stop, and Henry has Fritz climb up across and cut the rope so a dead man can fall below. The neck's broken so they can't use his brain. We're at medical college now, and the professor shows the differences in the brains of a normal brain and an abnormal brain. He says these samples will remain here for their further inspection. He dismisses class, and Fritz sneaks in to steal the normal brain. However, he drops a jar on the ground when a gong bangs. He takes the abnormal brain instead and sneaks out. Elizabeth asks Victor for help. She's heard from Henry for the first time in months. Henry says his work comes before her. He tells her he's living in a watchtower outside of town. She tells Victor of the experiments he does. Victor says he saw him three weeks ago and no one can visit his lab. Victor shoots his shot and offers to reach out to Dr. Waldman, Henry's old college professor. He goes to leave and Elizabeth says she's joining him. Victor and Elizabeth are with Waldman now and he tells them he's changed and wants to create life. Waldman tells them he was only interested in human life to destroy it and bring it back. Elizabeth asks him to join them to go find Henry. We're at Henry's lab now and he asks if Fritz has finished his connections. Henry listens to electrical connections from the storm and he tells Fritz nothing to fear. No blood, no stitches and he says one final test. They turn on the switches and Fritz returns saying there's someone here as we hear a knocking noise. Fritz opens the door telling Waldman they can't come in and leave. They yell out to Henry and tell who they are and Henry lets them inside. Henry tells Elizabeth to leave. Trust me tonight. Victor calls him crazy and Henry takes offense. He tells him to come on up and ask if they're sure he wants to come in to see his experiment. He asks Victor and Elizabeth to sit down and Fritz yells to Waldman to not touch. He tells him he found a greater raid than ultraviolet and he's going to bring life to the dead. That body was never alive. It's all bits and pieces from graves he's robbed. Waldman inspects it and verifies he's right. They uncover the body and raise it towards the opening in the roof. They bring the body back down and its arm is moving. He's alive, he yells and says, I know what it feels like to be God, as Victor and Waldman grab him. All right, Brian, that's the opening set of scenes you got. We kind of ended on an iconic scene. Uh, what would you think about it? Yeah, there really couldn't be a better introduction that really says what a different time you're basically being transported to than having the introduction like this, which I added to the start of this episode as well. Uh, something Sir Alfred Hitchcock would obviously carry forward. And, and that's what I personally think of when I see this, quote, warning to the audience, which was smart marketing back then. I mean, it was nearly all word of, word of mouth back then. So if someone left here because they were scared, shit. That did nothing but good to draw those people, you know, people in like us that are, are looking to be scared. Right. Uh, now we got to talk about these credits right off the bat. I mean, look, it's the thirties and that is slapped all on our faces. Like Kevin Williamson's big script writing dick when it says that it's, it's from the novel by Mrs. Percy B. Shelley. So instead of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which we all know now they used her husband to show screenplay credit fucked up, but it's also history, so we have to, you know, definitely call that out. This big ass question mark for who played the monster cracks me up a little bit. I mean, like people think it's really a monster. I don't know. It's silly, but it's also part of it. I mean, this was a quote shocking movie back then. So, I mean, whatever it takes to, you know, just totally immerse the audience, I I'm all for it. You know, obviously, we know it's the man Boris Kar Karloff who who was 44 when this movie came out. And yeah, late bloomer to stardom, but we, we know the star he, he became after this. Hell, a ton of people didn't live that long anyway. I mean, look at Colin Clive, who, who played Henry. He died six years after this movie at just 37 years old from, from tuberculosis. And I love his performance in this and Bride of Frankenstein. He, he steals this movie, no matter how great Karloff, uh, Karloff is. It's, it's nothing without him. Um, lastly, you know, I just, I feel like I've talked and not even commented on the movie here. <laughs> This cemetery is obviously on a soundstage. Well, let me back up. This is just a cold open, and I love it. Like, there's no real context given, nothing. We're just, bam, we're just in this very stylized cemetery. And, and I even love cold opens like that today when we're just thrown in the shit. Um, they also put a microphone in this coffin so you, you could really hear the dirt hitting the coffin. Brilliant touch, I thought, as well. Uh, funny, my guy... Uh, Henry couldn't see the label that said abnormal brain. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Uh, everyone in this class looks like they're 40 years old, I thought. You know, and, and fuck you, Victor, trying to move in on my guy's girl. 
Henry, you need to get your ass down from your tower. It said he's, she said four damn months, and you send a letter to your girl. And I mean, like, how far away is this shit? Because I mean, they just hop on out the door and, and head up there later. Like it's yeah, you know, right down the old fucking whispering path through the woods there. I thought it was funny that uh, all the dude had to do was was call Henry crazy, and he's like, "Okay, come on up." Who does he think he is? He's fucking Marty McFly here. And last thing, this was the this was the first film to actually use that now famous Castle Thunder sound effect as well. Um, so great open. I'll shut up now. Oh no, you're good, man. I shoot, I agree. I love this open. Like I said in my intro, I kind of feels like we're watching a really fancy play. You know, like a stand-up uh, Broadway type production. When you get this, you know, guy comes out on the stage and with basically a warning. You know, now we just get words on the screen, but this guy's trying to, you know, set the, you know, set the essence, set the ambience. And I thought it it plays really well even now. I think it would be fun for a movie to review to revisit this every now and then. Um, look, l- let's not, you know, lie. The production value of this movie, viewing it in 2023, is not great. <laughs> Even when you watch it in 4K, black and white, which I found it in 4K, so, you know. But even when you watch it in the fanciest high depth, it, and, and again, we weren't probably supposed to view it that way. So we see little things that, that, that you know, probably you didn't see on a grainy television back then. But that being said, I love the feeling this movie gives me when I watch it. It is a time I'm unfamiliar with, um, going back almost 100 years. And it's a really good, like time capsule to just kind of go back and it be in this mindset. So it just has a certain charm. It really does. Um, this dude has some of the craziest eyes I've ever seen. I think he, the Dr. Frankenstein, I mean, and he put, this is some really good acting. Like I think going back, you know, we, 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 we talked about the story and how that makes the movie so strong. I really think the acting holds up over time. You know, I think all the performances are really well done, and I think that helps the movie age even better. I'm not gonna lie, you said all the men look 40, or everybody look 40 in that class, Brian. I'm surprised there were even women in that class in 1931, to be honest with you. I mean, they didn't let Mary Shelley or I mean, have her shine, so I'm really shocked that they even let a woman in this class. I, on the glass vat, the, the, the tape says abnormal brain, <laughs> just right on it, like this is the abnormal brain, not the normal brain, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, I thought that may be Crispin Wall's brain in that bat. Oh, sorry. Anyway, um, what I said, abnormal brain. It's not my fault. Um, the cuts, I talked about the cuts in the open, but it's like those like black screens that we get every time like a scene changes. Again, it reminds me of watching like a cool play. And I think it's just a different time of filmmaking. And I really enjoyed that. I love the structure of this movie. Some of the dialogue, it feels so foreign. It's so different to hear these characters talk to each other because they don't talk to each other the way the four of us talk to each other, which that's probably a good, a good thing sometimes. Uh, I, and, but it, again, it almost feels like a different language sometimes. And I, it's kind of like, I have to really pay attention because they're saying, they're saying similar words, obviously. I'm not saying it's in a different language, but it just feels foreign to me when I watch it. I love Dr. Frankenstein. I think, that Colin Clive does a great job. Uh, he starts to kind of portray a man that's gone mad a little bit, but it's slow. It's not just like all of a sudden I'm Mr. Crazy Man. He kind of like has little turns here and there, and then he can snap back in to being a little bit of a normal guy. I think the the dungeon electricity, like that that whole setting is great, I, I, and I think it it holds up really well. So well that they used it in movies all the way up into the seventies. So really well built set, uh, and and I think the electricity stuff looks good. I I just think all of this stuff looks really well. Obviously, you have the iconic line of "He's alive, it's alive," um, and I really I love this opening set of scenes. I will finish this by saying the next set of scenes I think drag just a little bit in comparison to this set and the final set. But overall, I, I I'm I'm really into the movie. Yeah, so I really love the opening monologue, um, like the warning to the audience. Like, it's just one of those things that just feels right about a classic movie like this. Uh, that was perfect. And then also, I, I love in the opening credits how, you know, they had just a question mark for who played the monster because it really made it more mysterious. Like, it kind of made it more creepy 
uh, not knowing who it was to begin with. Uh, I thought that was a good touch. Um, now, one of the things about when Fritz is, you know, out there still in the brains, why did he take the lid off the normal brain container? Like, he picked it up ta- off the table, he took the lid off so that when he dropped it, it would be ruined. Okay. Uh, and then <laughs> what the hell was that sound that made him drop it? Like, it was just this loud clanging noise that was not explained and nothing, like, not, never acknowledged. It was just, oh, we need something to make him drop it and make there be a reason he takes the bad brain. Um, also, you mentioned how you're surprised there was even women in that class. Uh, John noticed that when the teacher dismissed the class, he said, gentlemen. He didn't say ladies and gentlemen. And there's clearly oh, okay. women in the class. He just addressed the gentleman. And then it, it's crazy also when they were walking out of that class just made me kind of realize it. But uh, it's crazy to look at fashion and style in a movie like this compared to today. Like everyone's wearing suits all the time yeah. with just like perfectly combed and slick back hair. And in comparison to everyone else in the movie, Fritz's hair looks insane in this movie. But honestly, <laughs> he looks like he would fit right into a 2023 movie. And so I thought that was funny. Um, and then, okay, so when they lift the monster up through the ceiling, look, it's a great concept. It's legendary, right? But I wish they would have relaxed on the thunder sound effects during this scene and when he's up there. Uh, you mentioned this is the first time they used this. So it's almost like, they, hey, we got something here. Let's get our money's worth. But um, I wish that there had just been a little bit of thunder happening. But then once he's raised through the ceiling, then we get our loudest and biggest thunder sound effect and maybe a flash to uh, make it more impactful about what had happened. Instead, it just constantly thundered the whole time. And it made it seem like he just needed some fresh air to come alive. Like it, it really cheapened the, uh, the fact that he needed the lightning strike. But um, the last thing I put is just, you know, after watching this set of scenes, yeah, Dr. Frankenstein might be genius, but Elizabeth's got to leave this guy. Like, this guy's fucking insane. And he clearly <laughs> devalues uh, your your situation there. So, um, you I know, think, she, hey, she, she needs to get out. Hey, hey, Dustin, I think they both kind of suck. I mean, no, she's kind of flirting with that guy at the beginning. Talking about how fond she is of him. And he, she mean, has needs. So, that fair. Sure. This sure. is like when Pearl's husband was off fighting and fighting the sure. war. Sure. And, you know. Well, Similar time needs. era. She has needs. She I can needs. give them to her. Call me some time. Oh, sorry. All right. Baron asked Victor and Elizabeth what's wrong with Henry. Things aren't adding up. The Burgomaster arrives and Baron asks what he wants. He asks when the wedding will be. Baron says if Henry doesn't return, never. Just cancel the plans. Burgomaster leaves and Baron says we're all left waiting on Henry and goes to find him. Back to the windmill and Waldman says these creatures should be kept under guard. Henry asks if he's ever wanted to do anything dangerous. Waldman tells Henry the brain stolen from his laboratory was a criminal brain. Only evil can come from it. You have created a monster and it will destroy you. They turn out the light as the monster joins them. He turns around revealing the iconic look. Henry looks at his creation and tells him to sit down. He tells Waldman he understands and the monster walks towards the light and raises his hands towards it. They shut the light off and his hands go back down. He has him sit down again. Fritz runs in and scares the monster. The men struggle to restrain the monster until they shackle him in a room. They tell him to be quiet and Henry leaves frustrated as Fritz waves the torch at him, scaring him. We hear a scream and Henry runs towards it, realizing it's Fritz. Henry finds the monster has hanged Fritz, killing him. They close the door as the monster pounds on it, growling. Waldman says we need to kill it like any stray animal. They make a plan to inject him with a hypodermic needle. The monster overpowers Henry at first until he passes out. Henry asks Waldman if he's hurt as Victor bangs on the door. He tells him Elizabeth and your father are on the way to see you. They put the monster back in the room. Baron says he doesn't like where his son is staying. He bangs on the door until he's let inside. Baron says this place seems to drive everybody crazy. Baron and Waldman introduce themselves and he tells him to get Henry out of here. Elizabeth walks in the room and Henry passes out. She calls for the others to help and they set him on a bed. They give him a shot of brandy and he comes to. He says he can't go home. He needs to tend to his work. Waldman offers to stay and destroy it. Waldman is at the operating table with the monster and writes notes down he observes. We see the monster's eyes blink and Waldman goes back to the table to cut him open. The monster grabs his neck from behind and sits up and strangles him. The monster escapes the tower. Elizabeth and Henry are home and he says it's like heaven being with you. He says he was obsessed with work. He asks when will their wedding be? 
She hopes it's soon, and they kiss. All right, Brian, that's the next set of scenes I got. What'd you think? I actually had the most on the set of scenes, so uh, bear with me here. Um, I think it's kind of weird going from that scene uh, straight to the Baron's house, I have to say. And fucking Victor, man, go find another girl to hang out with. Like, why the hell are they always together? So I'll go back, and I know it was the last set of scenes, but I got to touch on the line Henry says after he says, It's alive! It's alive! Where he says, uh, No, I know what it feels like to be God. Another sign of the times, that line was actually censored for or on certain releases for years because it was seen as being sacrilegious. Different times, different times. Now we get Mike saying that on any given day. It's crazy. The thing that stands whoa, out to me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I would never do that. What are we talking mm-hmm. about? Anyway, this, uh, the thing that stands out to me in this set of scenes is I the would, scene uh, with uh, Henry and the doctor going back and forth with that age-old question. That Star Trek taught me, actually. Just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should do that thing. And I think it's brilliantly written and acted out scene between the two of them. Uh, in the original book, the creation of Frankenstein was left pretty ambiguous. Uh, Mike, you said you read it, even going as far as insinuating magic or supernatural involvement. But here it's grounded and we get the lightning rebirth that, you know, we'll go on to see time and time again over the next hundred years. Most notably, Jason six zombie re- Jason rebirth rebirth there. Um also, let me give some credit to Ken Strickfadden, the set designer. I mean, he wanted to go away from something that looked realistic, and he came up with this set that's just iconic now. And, of course, it's synonymous with, with Universal Studios, period. Oh, and, of course, Jack Pierce's makeup on the monster, absolutely iconic. I mean, now we take for granted that, you know, this look is Frankenstein. I know it's touchy, you know, between – Frankenstein and and like we talked about earlier and calling it the monster. But look, the second one kind of answers that question. So I'm going to just call him Frankenstein. But yeah, someone had to come up with this look, uh, this iconic look to start with. And that was Jack Pierce. And, and Barloff even even removed his partial bridge work as part of the monster makeup process to, to create that sunken cheek look. And, uh, you know, Karloff's performance really is beautiful. And the car, the character arc of Frankenstein in you know, I mean, like I, the criminal brain does try to explain some of this, but really and truly, and look at how this creature is treated. I mean, the character, yeah, it's always tragic, you know, but I think it starts here. I mean, he's basically a scared kid at first and, you know, that we get fired, abuse and, you know, you definitely feel sorry for him. I mean, damn, you see fire spooking the guy, you dip shit and your boss tells you to go away with it. But hell no, you just hover around with him. It's just dumbass. Uh, which brings me to the last thing, Fritz, the dumbass. He's played by Dwight Fry. You know, it's kind of funny how your mind plays tricks on you, mine anyway. I mean, the 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 mad scientist helping hand with the with the hunked uh, hunchback is is always called Igor, right? I mean, so I assumed it was taken from this, but obviously it was not. Um, you know, Fry also played Renfield in in Dracula, which you know that we're doing next week and. And or where at least we're doing next, uh, and also Son of Frankenstein and Frankenstein meets the Wolf some nearly ten years later. So the character of Fritz works on a lot of different levels, even if he is a dumbass. I mean, really, this entire thing is is really his fault. Let's just go ahead and put that out there. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the first thing I have here is the fact that that God line is in there, um, and like you mentioned, it was very controversial at the time. You know, it was almost a little bit. It almost took me back, you know, it took me aback watching it this time. Not because I'm offended, but just because, oh shit, you know, 1931, I'm surprised that slipped past the censors, but obviously it didn't slip past the censors. So I guess that makes sense. Look, I love the look of this monster. And I know we had, we have much cooler, better looking movie monsters since then. I mean, makeup and effects have gone just out, you just insane. You know, you look at the, some of the makeup effects on the characters in Stranger Things and, and you, then you look at this Frankenstein and you're like, uh, these two are from different planets as far as effects go. But there's something really good about the simplistic nature of this makeup. You, you, you mentioned the sunken cheek, you know, the just the way his forehead looks, it just has a certain feel that that's so iconic and such, such a recognizable look that you know, they look, I always say the scary movie kind of ruined Scream for a lot of people. And I think because that's because they get the two movies confused. 
But when I think of this particular Frankenstein, I always think of Herman Munster. They look so fucking similar. They're both in black and white. They have the same look. Obviously, Herman Munster is based off Frankenstein. So, like, I, it, it's so weird to kind of see the original that spawned all of this. I think it really holds up. It does a great job. You mentioned Boris Karloff. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. I think I know that's Thor Ravenscroft that sings it, but, you know, Boris Karloff is a part of the a, 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 animated Grinch special. But I, um, I think Boris Karloff does a great job. Kind of a bumbling idiot in a way, but wouldn't you be if you just, you're now birthed out of nowhere because of lightning strike, which by the way, notice how we use lightning and not dog piss. Just throwing that out there. Freddy's dead. Anyway, what? Did I say something? What? Where did that come from? Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's how the Nightmare on Elm Street brought Freddy back one time. Fucking dog piss. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm not oh. wrong. Uh, but <laughs> lightning much better. Then you get like it, you know, just you mentioned that just because you should do something doesn't, you know, or you can do something doesn't mean you should you get this whole thing where now the doctor has to kill him and all this other stuff. And that, like you said, I, I feel bad for Frankenstein, you know, and I think this movie's trying to make us feel bad, especially in the next set of scenes. I think it, it works even better. But one thing, and it, this is really all I had, because I thought this, this set of scenes kind of dragged a little bit. The dad is a fucking asshole. Like, he's one of the most annoying characters that are, he, he's one of the characters I've been most annoyed with in a movie in a long time. Like, he's, like, he's almost too honest to a point where I want to punch him in the face and tell him, hey man, you're not so great. Uh, you're not so smart. But, you know, he plays the asshole well. So, all in all, I thought this, this set of scenes dragged a little bit. I'm not going to lie. There's a lot that goes on, but to me, this is the set or the section that had a harder time keeping my interest. We kind of get back on track here in the last set of scenes. So yeah. Uh, when we get our first look at the monster, I think it's fantastic. I like the slow reveal uh, with him, you know, walking backwards and then turn it around. And then the close, uh, the close up we get and the multiple angles of his face. I thought that was just brilliantly shot. Um, and I love how stoic and muted the monster was until the presence of light. Like he was just very, uh, like I said, stoic and ominous. And then light comes in and all hell breaks loose. And that's why Fritz really deserve all the bad things. Like I don't feel sorry for Fritz. How could you? Um, he was patronizing and, and annoying the shit out of the monster. And so, yeah. Okay. Uh, now when the monster gets subdued though, I did laugh because they did a close up shot of him. And his face, and he, he was, like, flailing his hands in front of the camera before he went down. I thought that shit was funny. Like, it was meant to be dramatic and, you know, invoke emotions, but it was just funny to me. Um, then when they took the monster back down into the side room, where the hell did Fritz's body go? Like, Fritz was just hanging there, and then they re-entered the room, and the body's completely gone and never referenced again, and nobody cut it down. Like, nobody got him down. So nope. that's an error, I believe. But um, just it's a very good set of scenes because, like I said, we get our first look at the monster and we observe his mannerisms, and it's just some classic shit. All right, guys, here's the ending. Uh, all of these movies this month will probably be pretty short reviews, guys, just uh, if, for all the listeners because these aren't the longest movies. But here's the ending. We're at the wedding now as Baron tells of the three generations. He tells Henry he hopes in 30 years his son will carry on the tradition. Baron has a toast as we see Henry is visibly bothered by something. Baron gives the house cleaner some champagne, then immediately sends him back to work. <laughs> it's a party in the streets as Baron speaks to the crowd. He tells them he hopes there's lots of beer. We see dancing in the streets in celebration. Maria's daddy leaves her to go into the village briefly. She plays with her new kitty as the monster appears. She walks to him and introduces herself and ask if he'll play with her. They get to the water's edge, and she gives him a flower. He smiles, and they share flowers. She throws a flower into the water, and he does too. But he now grabs her and throws her into the water. He panics when he realizes she's drowned, and he runs into the woods. Back to the festivities in the streets, and we see Elizabeth in her dress. She needs to see Henry for a minute. She kicks out her bridesmaids and tells Henry there's, something, there's nothing wrong. She says she's afraid. Where's Dr. Waldman? Something is going to happen. I can feel it. Something is coming between us, she says, and she wants to save their relationship. She doesn't want to lose Henry. 
Victor knocks and, and tells Henry Dr. Waldman has been murdered. They realize the monster is in the house and go to look for it. We see the monster sneak into the room with Elizabeth through the window. She screams as he, as he chases after her. Henry runs back to her and we hear glass shatter. Funny that's, we read that on Austin 316. They find Elizabeth in a panic. We see the father carrying little Maria's dead body through town now as the people follow him. There's chaos in the street. The father tells the burgomaster she's been murdered. Henry says there can be no wedding until the monster is taken care of. He leaves to go find him. The burgomaster splits the people up to go find the monster. A mob is in pursuit and they split up. An injured man points at the direction the monster went. Henry and the monster fight and he yells for help. The others run to assist him and the monster carries Henry away. They release the dogs after him as they go back into the windmill. They get to the top and he snarls at the mob. Henry awakes and tries to escape but is grabbed. Monster throws Henry and he hits a windmill blade. The crowd runs to him and they take Henry to town for medical aid. They light the tower on fire now and the monster screams in fear. A support beam falls in him, trapping him to the floor. Back at the house and the servers offer to give Henry a glass of great-grandmother's wine. Baron pours a glass and says Henry doesn't need this and drinks. The end. Brian, what would you think about the ending, brother? Uh, I, I will say this and I may be blasphemous to say i don't know but you don't really know how much a horror soundtrack adds to a movie until it's not there anymore the music i mean which you know props to these actors and actresses for for holding something together like this with no music soundtrack as we know today and <laughs> i wrote so this is the wedding that we had some dude earlier bust up in the baron's house i mean it's no subtle wedding that's for sure that's what i wrote but <laughs> the the Maria thing is super tragic. Don't get me wrong, but I laughed a little bit. Like it reminded me of that meme that we see for fuck them kids all the time that has John Wayne tossing some kid in the lake. It shouldn't have made me laugh, but nowadays it kind of does. But back then I get it. It was probably like the most awful thing ever. Actually, Carl off uh, one of the story chains and him not to kill the little girl, but Whale argued that it was essential to the story, so this is what we get. So, and did I miss it? Can somebody tell me how Maria's dad knew that she'd been murdered? I mean, couldn't she have just I thought fell, the same thing. And she just fell in a lake the, and yeah, drowned? Fallen in a lake, yep. You're the dipshit that didn't fucking, yep. you know, watch your daughter. I mean, it's, I mean, I know it's the 30s, but, you know, shit, it's not the dark ages. Actually, never mind. This is supposed to take place, I think, in the 1800s sometimes. So they did angry mob people to death all the time for no reason back then. I don't know. Uh, the now super cliche uh, angry mob with the, the pitchforks and the fire. Um, hell, that kind of mob mentality is coming back in style. So, hey, who am I to down talk it? Uh, not going to lie, seeing Henry's body be tossed. I mean, even Nico, even Nico laughed when he was reading it, tossed it at the windmill. I mean, you're like, wow, no way he's alive. And apparently it wasn't supposed to be at first, but they reshot it and I'm glad because otherwise we don't get Clive and Bride and we need Clive back. Uh, I love the uh, fuck the doctor. Let's just take Henry home. He may have every broken body bone in his body, but eh, it's fine. As Billy Crystal says in the princess bride, he's only mostly dead. <laughs> so either way, a yeah, fitting third act, but it's a little weird. You know, it's kind of weird to see that abrupt ending to a, such a classic movie with old, Paul Paul Frankenstein just kind of chugging some booze and then we get the credits. I don't know, a little that was a little bizarre there, but as far as the whole third act, not bad at all. Uh I read that like I read online like a while back, a long time ago, I think actually, the fact that movie endings weren't really a big deal until like 50 cinema. So like like how a movie ended really wasn't that important. So I that article came back to me when I watched this because I thought the same thing. I'm like, huh, that's fucking that's a dumb way to end. But anyway, um, one thing I will say, man, when you watch this movie now, this movie's sad as shit as far as how the monster is treated, how the monster is seen, the fact that it's even up and running. Go ahead, Brian. Well, isn't – I mean, you said you read the book, right? I mean, isn't that – A long like, time ago. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, because, I mean, ago. from what I know, and I haven't read it, but isn't it like super sad and kind of yes, a tragic absolutely. story anyway? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. From what I remember, again, I was in the 10th grade, so, you know, it's, it's been quite a while. But this movie is sad, like, in, in a way, the way that we view the monster um, or, or get to see him. You, you know, 
again, you mentioned it, Brian. You kind of feel bad for the guy. He's bumbling and stumbling around, and he, he shouldn't be alive in the first place. And here he is. He's been brought back to life not once but twice, you know, uh, without any say so in the matter. So I think that is, I think they do a good job of getting that across. Kills the little girl. I'm not going to lie. I got a little bit of a cheeky laugh. <laughs> Me too. But it is terrifying. I put myself in the shoes of someone in 1931 and thought, God, I bet that was fucking just something to see. And I think, you know, it's like seeing Psycho in the theater for the first time. You're like, God damn, I bet that was terrifying. So I'm sure that was really scary. I mean, this movie must be where the trope of not believing women came from because no one believes her. Uh, already in the 30s, we're starting this trope where that just continues in the in the horror genre for almost a fucking century now. Um, so that's a trope. And I know I may be the only nerd that thought this, but. These two saw each other b- before the wedding. That's, man, that's a bad, that's a curse right there. That's bad luck. I don't know what we're doing out here. Um, like a nerd. <laughs> that shit won't ever laugh. That's all I'm saying. By the way, Boris Karloff made me laugh my ass off when he, they put the camera right up in his face and he went, rawr. <laughs> it, got, it fucking made me laugh so bad. I was like, oh, you're, you've done so good in this movie and yet you really hit me with a rawr. Like you were, you know, a screamo chick from 2007. Um, it's really how it came across. I thought it was quite funny. You mentioned the town mob trope. I have it too. I, I was like, man, this thing is consistent in the horror genre. You get the nightmare franchise. How Ween's had it multiple times. Uh, people have been trying to take out horror movie monsters for almost a century now in an angry town mob. And 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 I think it's really interesting to my his like my history brain to go back and know this is. Not maybe the origin of it, but it certainly starts to build as a trope because of this film. And I think this movie's ultimate message, and then I'll be done, is we are the we are the monsters. I I think that's the movie's point. I think that's the book's point is that we are the monsters, not Frankenstein's monster. And I and, and I think it tries to turn that around on us. I think it does a good job. The ending, you know, a little flat, but I thought this set of scenes was really really good. Yeah, so I like how in this final act we get away from the monster for a bit and uh, we see that, you know, everybody's back to living a normal life or a semi-normal life at least uh, for a little bit. And then I love the scene with the monster and the little girl. Uh, You could see, I mean, this does a great job of building sympathy for the monster because he just wants to be a friend. Uh, He he wants affection. And when he ends up accidentally killing her, that's some some heavy stuff there that's sad because he literally didn't know any better. Um, and then, you know, Elizabeth tells Henry that she's worried and begs him not to leave her. And in return, he uh, stuffs her back in the room and locks the door. That's just cold blooded. I feel you um, <laughs> stay toxic. My friend, uh, I like the tension that we get when the monster got in the room with her. Um, you know, she doesn't see that he's behind her and like that. That's a good classic stuff right there with some built in tension. And then we get a great long shot here of the dad, carrying the little girl's body through the town. Uh, I thought that was just so well done because everybody's having a good time, having a great time, which, uh, by the way, Mike, you mentioned the time frame. So James well actually mentioned that he didn't want it to be set in a specific time. Like this, this movie takes place in its own universe. Um, so late 1800s, 1900s, there is no time frame. There is no location. It's just its own thing. But, um, You know, they're having that festival there. And I thought the way they shot this was great because as he walks by, you see people's faces just change and their their, uh, energy just shift when they realize, oh, my God, she's dead. And so that was some some really good stuff there. Uh, Then once Frankenstein is, you know, up in the windmill or the tower or whatever you want to call his lair there uh, with the monster. So the monster tosses his ass off the top. Like the Undertaker tossed Mick Foley off the cell at, at Hell in the Cell. Uh, only thing missing was Jim Ross saying, "My God, as God is my witness, he's broken in half." But it was kind of funny to watch, though. This is what I was talking about in my open about some of the effects, because uh, the way that body just tumbled through the air, you could tell that it was a dummy and not a real body. And it's no fault of theirs. I mean, at the time, dummies and stunt doubles like that, I'm sure would have been impossible to make it look realistic, but um, it was just something that stood out to me. And, you know, that's one of the downsides to watching these old movies in 2023 
um, after what we're used to seeing on screen. But it also made me realize that, you know, the backdrop that they were using for the sky in this set of scenes as they're going up the mountain, like the backdrop that had the clouds and stuff, it had wrinkles in it. Like there were visible wrinkles in it. And so it's like, okay, not the most real looking, realistic looking sky backdrop there. But, um, and then man, setting, setting the damn place on fire with him in it. That's a rough way to go. Uh, I could think of about you know, easily 50 to 75 ways I'd rather die than being burned alive. So that's cold blooded there. Cause again, he didn't ask for any of this shit. He didn't ask to be reanimated and brought back to life. And he didn't know what the hell he was doing. He was just going to set him on fire. Okay. But, uh, you know, after that's done and we go back home, yeah, I don't know what the point of six young women taking one bottle of wine to Henry was. Um, I guess it was a very heavy bottle of wine. Um, and I also don't know what the point of Barron's closing the door. It's like, nah, he doesn't need it. Okay. Like, it was just a very weird closing to the movie. But overall, um, overall is a solid, solid conclusion and in, in solid film overall. All right, guys, let's jump into our social media comments and questions, and we'll do fun facts. I'll do Facebook first. The 100 Sanford podcast commented, can't wait for this. Much different in presentation, but for the but for the era, many were creative and before their time. Okay, I think that's supposed to be present, but it got auto-changed, but hey, damn technology. And Kevin Podoff commented, hells yeah, that's a classic. Can't wait to hear. All right, brother, appreciate your comment. Let's jump over to Twitter. Uh, Sean Irwin commented, it's about time y'all got around to Boris Karloff. Can't wait to hear Nico gripe about this the whole episode. Come on, man. All right. <laughs> hey, man, Randy, you have a reputation, you know. I mean, you know, saying I got to, I got to live up to it. That's Randy, right. Randy Smith commented, excited to hear y'all talk about such an amazing horror classic, one of the most influential movies of all time. I could, I could see that, definitely for sure. All these universals are very influential. And Andrew Ferguson commented, how do y'all focus on this show when it's opening night of the NCAA tourney? Uh, I, I don't, I don't give a damn about that. To be I'm honest, I'm doing with you, both, buddy. I got screens up. We're good. I'm doing both. <laughs> yeah, if Florida State's not in it, I if, couldn't care less. FSU won not what nine games this year. I don't give a damn about no basketball right now. There you go. Bingo. Oh, Bulls man. are gonna miss the playoffs. FSU missed the tournament. What the fuck? fuck? Exactly. It's all, it's all about. Man, I can't believe this. It's baseball ah, season. Not quite. <laughs> all season, the World Baseball Classic's going on. That's what I'm focused on. And it's NASCAR season. I'll be watching both. World Baseball Classic as well. You should tune in. All right, let's jump over to Instagram now. Uh, Missy Hudson Wall commented of all the classic of all the classic movie monsters, Frankenstein is my favorite. The makeup is phenomenal, and you can emphasize with him. At least I did with a heart emoji. Okay. Uh, Matt Strickland commented, "It's alive, alive." Having not been my first ever horror movie intro, I find Frankenstein very interesting and can totally see how it would have been scary when it was first released. I can't help but think of young Frankenstein when I watch this one, though. Kind of like how the scary movie franchise is to all the movies they parody, LOL. Still a great watch, and if you haven't seen it, you better. Who is y'all's favorite character? The Doctor, for me. Like the old man Doctor? Yeah, Doctor The guy that did the intro? Oh, Oh, okay. I didn't know if you meant the dude that did the open Doctor or the... uh, Yeah, Dr. Valdez, I thought you meant. Um, Yeah. yeah. No, my bad. All right. I don't have one, man. (laughs) No, you better pick one. You better fucking no. pick one. I don't know. Uh, the little girl that died? Jesus wow. Christ. She seems sweet. She seems sweet. Uh, okay. Last comment. The Black Hawk Solo. This is, a really, oh, sorry. this is a really good comment. The Universal Films will always have a weird place in my heart because of the eeriness and seriousness of these films. My top three being The Invisible Man, Dracula, and tonight's pick, Frankenstein. I grew up on black and white movies because my parents were are old school. My dad is into westerns and my mom digs horror. So I've seen this a million times. And even as a kid, it baffled me that they killed a little girl on screen in 1931. I agree with that. Probably one of my favorite scenes because of the innocence and realization of the monster's face of what he's done. Fun fact, that scene wasn't added until the 1986 reissue of the film. This is also one of my favorite directors, Quentin Tarantino's favorite Universal Monsters, because when he was a kid, he listened to a Frankenstein record where the monster attacked this family and ripped the dad's arms from his sockets, and it was told from the POV of the son. Okay. Nice. That's okay. interesting. <laughs> That's some good stuff. Uh, all right, let's jump into fun facts. Brian, you want to kick us off with any? 
I don't have any. Yeah. I'll let y'all have yeah, that. Yeah, I've got a few. Uh, the Monsters makeup design by Jack Pierce, like I talked about, is actually under copyright to Universal through the year 2026 and licensed by Universal Studios Licensing. Um, just coming up on that quick. Uh, Forrest Ackerman recalled visiting Clive's body when he passed away six years after this. He quotes said, I actually saw him in death lying in a bed at a mortuary where it was possible for the public to view his body. He looked remarkably as he had when lying in bed in the Bride of Frankenstein, which he would play in 1935. Uh, a 20-minute test reel starring Bella Lugosi as the monster and directed by Robert Florey was, was filmed on the Dracula 1931 sets. This footage has not been seen since 1931 is considered lost, but only a poster featuring the vague likeness of Lugosi as a 30-foot colossus monster remains. Uh, two more here. According to film historian, this one kind of, this one shocked me a little bit. According to film historian uh, uh, Gregory Mank, director James Whale was jealous of the attention that Boris Karloff's monster was getting during production and took revenge by making the Karloff, the Karloff, by making Karloff carry Colin Clive up the mountain to the mill in take after take dozens of times. Clive felt badly for his co-star and suggested, you know, that a dummy be used. Whale refused, and Karloff continued to have to carry Clive's six foot, one hundred fifty four pound body in succeeding takes. That surprised me. I really didn't know that about James Whale. And lastly, assuming its copyright has not lapsed already, this film and all produced, all others produced in nineteen thirty one, enter the U.S. public domain in 2027 something we're actually seeing right now with you know winnie the pooh and a lot of those characters all right i got a couple um during production there were some concerns that seven-year-old marilyn harris who played maria the little girl who's thrown into the lake uh that she would be overly frightened by the sight of the Bo uh, boris kaloff in his uh, costume and makeup so when the cast was assembled to travel to the location for shooting Harris ran from her car directly up to Karloff, who was in full makeup and costume, took his hand and asked, may I drive with you? Delighted and in typical Karloff fashion, he responded, would you, darling? And she rode to location with the monster. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, Marilyn Harris also, she had done several takes of Maria being thrown into the lake, none of which turned out right. And although wet and tired, she agreed to do one last take of the scene, and it's the one that actually appeared in the scene. Uh, after James Whale promised her anything that she wanted, if she would just do one more take, she asked for a dozen hard boiled eggs. That was her favorite snack. What the fuck kind of, he gave her two dozen, but that's your, okay. Times have changed. Dozen hard boiled eggs, my ass. Um, Mary Shelley was only 19 years old when she wrote the novel. It's impressive stuff there. I mean, but Webby was 20 when he recorded Savage Life. So do with that information with what you will. Um, Boris Karloff's makeup took four hours to apply each day, and uh, his costume weighed 48 pounds approximately in the uncomfortable heat of the summer. So that sucked. And his shoes weighed 13 pounds a piece. Those shoes were actually uh, the kind of shoes that men would wear when they were pouring asphalt. So they had very thick soles. Um, in 1991, Frankenstein was added to the National Film Registry by the United States Library of Congress. And the last one I've got is that the film was banned in Kansas upon its original original release on the grounds that it exhibited cruelty and tended to debase morals. Interesting. Hmm, times have changed. <laughs> times have certainly changed. Uh, yeah, so this movie was made for a cool $262,000, and it grossed $12 million. So no wonder it is a classic uh, pretty instantly, honestly. It, it scared the crap out of people. If you look up the reactions at the time, uh, this movie really did send send people into a frenzy because of its content, because of its intent. Uh, some of the dialogue was even risque at the time. Um, and so this movie, like I said, made $12 million for a reason. All right, guys, let's jump into our favorite kill, least favorite kill in the rating. Uh, I'm kicking us off tonight. My favorite kill... And I got to put it in the context, like Black Han Solo said, I'm going with the Maria, the little girl of my favorite kill. Not because I like seeing kids get killed, but it was really brave for that time to do that. And heck, a lot of our favorite horror movies won't do that now. So, you know, I, I think that was 
bold of them, and I like that. Least favorite kill, I mean, you could go with a lot. I'm just going to go with, like Dead Meat said, Waldman off screen. Uh, you could have showed us that, I think. Uh, rating, this is an iconic movie. It's uh, it's the foundation, one of the foundational movies of horror. Uh, Boris Karloff is an icon. Frankenstein is an icon. Uh, I thought the acting was fine. I thought there were, you know, some good scenes. Uh, but did I really enjoy watching it? No, not really. Would I ever watch it again? Nah, probably not. Uh, it just didn't for me. So I'm just going to give it a flat three. Whew, all right. And I'm being respectful at three. Oh, my God. Okay. Whew, going to bring down our average. No big deal. Uh, all right. So, got to be honest on this show, people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Nico, you said something I was about to say. My favorite kill is Maria because had the balls to kill kid. I've talked about that on the show before. It's crazy how they do it in 1931, but not a lot of people have the balls to do it now, so I really enjoyed that aspect as well. So shout out to, to uh, Black Han Solo for that as well. I think that was a really good idea. Look, there's a number of off-screen kills or kills I don't like, so that takes your pick there. Um, look, this movie is a classic. It's one of the foundation, one of the pillars that the horror genre is built upon, and I think it deserves its flowers. I honestly think it's one of the few really old classic horror movies that, that is discussed that holds up really, really well. Like, I, I, I am a big fan of this movie. It's made me want to go watch the sequels that I haven't seen before. So that's, you know, something I really need to dive into as well. Never seen Bride um, in my life. So I, I'm excited to do that now because of a rewatching of this movie. I, I thought it was really good. The acting, the, you know, the, you know, the set pieces. The old timey feel that it gave me. It, it, it was just a really interesting, good watch. And for its time, I, it, it was probably just revolutionary. Now I can view it through a little bit of not a nostalgic lens, but a little bit of a fuzzy lens. I'm going to tip my cap because it's so legendary. I'm going to give this movie a 7.5. So my favorite kill, I'm also going to go with the little girl, but for a slightly different reason. Uh, just because, you know, I ain't give out a man fucked in kids award in a while. So. Uh, the monster gets a man fucked in kids award in this one unintentional. Um, it would have been cooler if he did it hereditary style, but it's okay. Um, my least favorite kill honestly was Fritz because he was a bitch and he deserved a worse death. Like I wanted to see him suffer more and then his body just disappeared. So we didn't even get the satisfaction in seeing him get disposed of. Uh, as far as the movie itself, it's very iconic. It's very influential. I mean, it's not a, stretch to say that we wouldn't get Friday the 13th without this movie. Um, you know, lightning reanimating someone is literally what happened in part six of Friday the 13th. Um, and that's just one example. I mean, this was so, so instrumental in, in establishing the horror genre and, and making it what it is today. There wouldn't be a don't go out there if there wasn't Frankenstein, Dracula, you know, some of the movies we're covering this month. So uh, taking that into consideration, and the incredible an hour, 10 minute runtime. I gave it an eight and a quarter. Okay. I'm not even going to read my, my kills, my least favorite kills. I just sent my, uh, my notes in the, in the group text. I literally had word for word for what Dustin said. He's in my head. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm not even going to read it. I mean, like literally even the girl fuck them kids, literally the exact same thing. So, um, so, you know, I mean, we talked about it. This story really is tragic. I mean, think about it. it. You know, all this monster knows is violence being taunted with fire, abused and chained up. And I mean, he's only a few days old. And like Dustin said, he doesn't know any better when he tosses that girl. I mean, how about you teach that chick how to swim, you shitty fucking dad? Anyway, classic, nostalgic, possibly the most influential of all the old classic universal horror movies. Um, I really, I, it was I was tossed. It was hard for me to figure out what to rate it. I actually went with an 8.5. I wish that now that I was already in Dustin's head, I wish it would have gone with an eight and a quarter, but I'm going to go with eight and 8.5. <laughs> like I had written down. Um, yeah. So that gives us a composite score of a uh, 6.8125. IMDB has it at a 7.8 viewer hey, rating. Nico. God damn it, Nico. But the meta score has it as a 91. So we're way off from the, from the paid critics. Man, Thanks fuck lot, them buddy. critics. Thanks a lot, buddy. <laughs> we take pride on this show with being honest and having integrity with that. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie on this show. 
Yeah, I we need an angry mob with, with pitchforks going after Nico. Man, bring it on. Stop Asian hate. All right, uh, any final thoughts where you shout out our blood donors? Uh, I'm good, man. No. All right. Uh, I just want to say we really appreciate all of our blood donors, our camper level reoccurring, Clayton J, Nina, Michelle Mirza, Andrew Ferguson, the Horror Movie Crew Podcast, Alex Seligson, Eric Doolittle, Sean Irwin, and Brian Samick. Our camp counselor reoccurring are Hunter Nelson, Dennis Kennedy, Edwin Hernandez Gunn, Joe Swinford, Jennifer Davis from the Too Close to Home Podcast, Heather Smith, Kylie Denise, all the way from Australia, Adrian Aiello, Jake Hambrick, Clay Moore, Karen, Matt Strickland, and Gail Kuntz. And we also have a final guy, a final girl donor, Missy Hutchinson Wall. We'll be doing her pick in a few weeks. Uh, just want to say thank y'all one more time. All right, uh, Mike, it's your pick next week for Horror Classic Month. You want to announce your pick? Yeah, are we doing – am I not announcing my birthday pick? Ooh, yep. And next week is Mike's birthday pick. <laughs> we want to announce what we're doing next week. <laughs> We will continue with another pick of mine after my birthday pick for Horror Classic Month. Yes, but I'll save that for that show. For my birthday, instead of doing a full-on movie review, um, we're going to switch it up kind of like we did for Nico's. We are going to do top 10 horror opening scenes. We've been wanting to do this for a long time, and I feel like my birthday was the perfect time to go ahead and request that we do this. Let's knock this thing out. So you're going to get a couple short episodes this month. I have a feeling that will run, you know, 35, 45 minutes or so. I'm very excited, though, because I, I this is the one list that we've done that I'm not really sure what all of you are going to say. Like, you know, when it comes to, like, final girls and guys and stuff like that, I have a loose idea of where everyone's going. I have no idea where everyone's going with this. I'm very excited we finally get to do it. Number one will be unanimous, I think. I think so, but you never know. You never know. Maybe I think so. But uh, Dustin, uh, fun theme. I mean, Absolutely. even if I'm not the biggest fan, it's something that we need to do. It's something that needs to be done on this show. We have to show respect to our the foundation of our favorite genre. Uh, any final thoughts before we just get out of here? All right. Just want to thank all our fans. We really appreciate y'all, and we'll see y'all next week for Top Ten Horror Opening Scenes. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. Just want to remind everybody. Oh.